Great. Well, welcome, Alex, uh, to the Full Table Podcast. Uh, I know we talked a little bit before, but I'd love to hear maybe a quick intro uh, to who you are, where you're from, and what your background is. Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm Alex Williams. I am from New Rochelle, New York, originally, which is a suburb about 30 minutes north of Manhattan. Um, born and raised there, I went to public schools there and then ended up going to Yale for college. Um, where I studied political science with a focus on U.S. social policy and urban development. Um, and at Yale, I was really involved with kind of club soccer and dance, which are both things I did throughout my life, um, and also super involved with our Black Student Alliance on campus. And since graduation, I've been working at the Bridge Band Group, which is a nonprofit consulting organization um, headquartered in Boston with offices in San Francisco, New York, Mumbai, and Johannesburg that um, provides advisory services to nonprofit organizations, philanthropists, foundations, um, impact investors interested in figuring out how to advance their missions across different fields and issue areas. Um, so I've been in Boston now for three years, which is where I'm calling in from. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, and we, we had met maybe 10 years ago now in New Rochelle and it's weird how it's weird how nowadays you can meet someone one time and then if you end up becoming social media friends, like I knew where you went to college and like <laughs> all that stuff years later. And totally. We or that like yeah. high school was 10 years ago is weird to me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the idea that like we could have our high school, 10 year high school reunion coming up soon is kind of daunting. But yeah, but yeah I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more maybe about what led you to pursue the career path you did if there were any experiences from when you were younger, either like cultural experiences, personal experiences that led you to, to pursue this as a career? Hmm, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I think for me from an early age, I can actually think of a few specific examples that sort of inspired my desire to do social impact work in general. Um, a lot, a large part of that comes from my family. Um, my dad and my mom are both super civically engaged, super um, invested especially in supporting black and brown communities in their careers, in their livelihoods. Um, and that was something that was sort of always instilled as a value for our family. I think one of the first feelings I had of like, what a, you know, cool job helping others could look like was when I went to the um, annual black and Hispanic legislative caucus in New York state when my dad was involved um, with New York state government for some time. And I was about 12 years old and like the only kid there because my mom didn't want to go. So my dad brought me, which was nice. And it was just this room filled of, filled with incredible leaders from communities across New York state who were just super focused on um, figuring out the the tools in their wheelhouse, be it policy or organizing, um, writing, advocacy, public speaking, just entirely focused on how can I best support the communities that I'm from, um, given the platform that I have. And I just remember looking around that room and seeing a bunch of people who looked like me or looked like my family um, and, not, and talking about things that made me feel inspired and um, that was kind of a pivotal moment at a young age where I was like, it would be cool to do a job that made me feel good, that felt like it was in support of the communities I cared about. Um, so then as I got older, I think I tried to, I don't know, continue to do community service and volunteer type of work throughout high school and that kind of thing. But I think the overall feeling when you're, I mean, not to speak on behalf of all Black people, obviously, but I think a feeling when you are um, a Black person in America is that there is one level of kind of sur survival, if you will, and like having a great life and supporting your family and feeling comfortable in your professional career, which is one, one level of success, if you will. And I think there's another level of success that's like my ability to succeed in this world, my desire to create a country better for future children of mine or future children of the world means that some part of my career I want to dedicate to um, kind of improving, um, improving what our country and our society looks like in that way. And I think, I don't think I always had the language to explain it in that way until much later, but that was also sort of a driving factor in my college and career choices. Yeah, 
that's that's a great answer. Um, one one thing you brought up about all the different potential platforms in which you can like create a positive change is something that I mean, just working on this podcast, it seems like uh, there are some platforms you can use that seem like maybe a good idea at the time that end up not being the best the best way to get the message across. And so I would love to hear maybe your thoughts on that. What one thing that we were looking at uh, was even just when that when we had Blackout Tuesday. And yeah. all of my friends were like posting the black square. And I was like, this seems like something that definitely can't be harmful. So I'll go ahead and do it. And then yeah. it turned out that you post the black, black square, but then we posted the wrong hashtag with it mm-hmm. briefly. So if you post the Black Lives Matter hashtag with it, then um, you're kind of like silencing. The whole purpose was to not have those voices be heard. So to, to use the Black Lives Matter uh, hashtag, it kind of like silences the whole movement by having just black squares come up when really people need to know what's going on with the protests, like where to sign up and do all these things. Yeah. And so I guess one thing that we had just kind of decided was like, if we're trying to do something in good faith, it's better to take the chance to potentially be wrong than it is just to sit back and be silent because we're afraid of doing the wrong thing. So I wonder if that's maybe something you have a, a viewpoint on. Yeah, it's a good question. I think, um, I think obviously the age of social media has just totally transformed how we can communicate with each other and how in many ways there's an even lower bar to saying something. Um, And there's like a higher risk of public scrutiny because of how broad your, your social platform may be. So I get that there's like sometimes inner turmoil for people who feel like I kind of want to say something, but I really don't have any particular language to use. Um, And what I've been thinking about is a lot of what actually matters is genuine action and intent and commitment to learning and to engaging in anti-racist work. And I think at least for me, I feel like I can pretty clearly decipher someone who is maybe a friend from high school or a friend from college who posted a Blackout Tuesday square, but like has never engaged on a topic of race before with me as a, you know, who's like somewhat of a friend or who I've never seen post about anything political otherwise. Um, Which is not to say that it's not okay if Tuesday was your start of that, but if it's if it's the end all and be all, then it's sort of definitely falls flat, I would say. Um, but I do think the point of speaking up, if you feel compelled or if you feel like there's an audience that you as a white person or you as a non-black person can speak to specifically that really matters, then I think it's really important to try and say something. You know, if you're like a, this is maybe a more extreme example, but let's say you're a you know, person who plays on a predominantly white sports team and you've heard people say things that are um, like slightly racist or super racist and you don't feel good about it anymore and you haven't had courage to speak up, I feel like there's an important way to say things that are addressed to that audience. So it's less about, I think it's less about let me demonstrate to um, black people or to other people who care about justice that I also care and more about let me demonstrate to people who may be in my network who aren't engaging yet that I want to engage with them and that I haven't before, but I am now in a really intentional way. I think that's a really cool way for non-Black people in particular to kind of enter this space and and bring people in in a way that um, others just can't sometimes because of who's in their circle. Yeah, and I I think that raises a couple really interesting points. One, the idea that, that I mean, of course, so, social media has just changed the game for these kind of things. And on on one front, there is like a degree of of almost like peer pressure that it forces people who would otherwise have stayed silent mm-hmm. to not stay silent because I mean, the whole I mean, I've been trying to read more about this as it's been going on, and the, the whole idea that being silent is, is is the same as being complicit. Like that's that's really heightened by the idea that if you see all of your friends post something and then you see one of them not post something, uh, it becomes ever ever more clear and I, I think even now that's extended extending to the way that we view companies um and the idea that like should companies have a political viewpoint or not um that discussion kind of got pushed to the side when I mean nearly every brand or restaurant or whoever I follow was all was all posting support of the George Floyd thing uh, but I think in from a bigger picture the 
the way that social media has been able to um, kind of change the dialogue around this this whole conversation is really interesting because it's not as if we weren't having these instances one, five or 10 years ago, um, but now it really feels like the response is just so much different. I mean, and maybe it's because, maybe it's partially because of coronavirus and that people don't have necessarily a distraction to go back to and there's no, there's no constant stream of like new news happening to like wash away uh, the horrible things um, that have happened. And so I wonder what, what, what are your thoughts on what really makes this circumstance different? Because we've seen protests like in 18 countries around the world, they've happened in every state. And, and I don't, at least in my lifetime, don't remember this kind of response happening to similar circumstances that I've, that I've witnessed in the news like years and years again. Yeah, it's a good question. And I think it's one that um, a lot of people are wrestling with of, you know, why is now different? Like, I think something I've talked to with uh, black colleagues of mine at work is like, why am I getting wellness emails now versus many other kind of traumatic experiences that have happened over the years that I've been working? Um, and I think there are a couple of things at play. I think one is a little bit of what you've described of this social capital piece. Like it's become um, in vogue to say Black Lives Matter, which is just like a significant shift from even five, six years ago now when Ferguson happened, where like that was a very controversial statement to say, which is, you know, another issue. But now it's kind of become a, some sort of demonstration of your, of your commitment, of your seeing someone. And so I think that peer pressure element has definitely been at play in full force in this situation, which, um, you know, I think if that can translate into real action is actually a really powerful accountability tool to have. I think the second thing at play is a little bit of, um, of um, trying to think of how to describe this. So basically a kind of consistent drumbeat that's been hit over many, many months. And I think now with people being at home with the George Floyd video being particularly gruesome and um, you know, clear in the sense of you know, kind of daylight execution while he's literally on the ground. I think there were certain things that then like clicked into place for some people in a way that they've been kind of on the periphery of for a long time. And how a colleague of mine described it is there's been, you know, a, a black news anchor or a black person at work or a neighbor or a friend or someone you follow who's been talking about this for a long time. And it's kind of subliminally entered people's consciousness over many years. And now there was kind of a like catalytic point where things sort of fell into place for people in a way that they've been building towards for a while, even if it wasn't intentional or conscious. Um, and that's just my point of view, but I do think there's something to that. And I think a large part of that is owed to um, activists and organizers who are actually out on the streets all of the time and most of the time don't get press coverage. Um, but because they do that, have built up the ability and power to mobilize people quickly and safely, which is what we've seen happen all over the country. Yeah, I, th I think that's a great point. A couple of the things, a couple of those things like really ring true for me in that, again, like I've seen these things numerous times over my life and it wasn't until this particular circumstance where I felt like being like silently against racism or if I was ever to see like overt acts of racism happen in front of me, I would at least tell, I tell myself that I would intervene or something, but that's not the same. And, and maybe, maybe before or during the other circumstances, I didn't quite understand uh, the degree that systemic racism plays into, mm -hmm. plays into this. And that's why, at least from my perspective, that's why being silent isn't enough to combat them. I, I remember since we were quarantined, um, I, I had watched the, the movie, I think it's called 13th. Mm -hmm. um, and it was talking about the incarceration rates. And that was for me, at least when it first really clicked to me, like, well, like, I think it's something like one in three black men ends up being incarcerated in their lives versus one in 17 white men. And so the idea that like, somehow, like ending slavery and electing Barack Obama, like undid the fact that one in three parents is like removed from their child's lives and like that we expect no long term ramifications for that that's when it all kind of started to click together for me. Uh, I know that there were like, there are movements out there like defund the police for instance, which 
at face level, if you don't look any more into it, it sounds kind of crazy. Um, but then after I heard about the incarceration rates and I heard about, um, I don't remember, I think one of my new was describing about how in a, in a white community versus a black community, if like, and, and, and this rings true for me, is that I have a bunch of friends who have had like very, Mm-hmm. Sorry, I think your hands on your speaker. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. I've had friends who have had very quote unquote like minor run run ins with the police, but they were only minor because the the future potential of the child was taken into consideration when the like when the ruling happened, right? So if you get pulled over with an open beer or something and you're driving home from a party but you have like college, college admissions is coming around the corner. They're like, oh, well, we're not gonna ruin the rest of your life. But that, that doesn't ring true for, um, for, for tons of people in the black community. And that's, that's what really kind of resonated with me. And so I wonder if you can talk a little bit more on what, what your thoughts are on the defund the police movement and maybe what concrete steps could be taken from here, whether that's changing the way that drug laws are enforced. Because that, that's another thing too, that for me, it just, it seems insane that we have I mean, on the very lowest level that we have people serving prison sentences for really long periods of time for marijuana, when in other states where it's been legalized, it's considered essential business and it hasn't even been closed during yeah. COVID. Uh, so that, to me, that seems like an insane thing and maybe a good place to start, but. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot in those questions. Um, I think in thinking about policing and incarceration in America, there's two very fundamental like interrelated problems one is that overall we over police we're an over policing state we have the highest prison per capita rate in the world the united states which is problematic on its own and the second fundamental piece of that is that our policing and incarceration tactics are rooted in racism and slavery and continue to create significant racial disparities that persist four generations. Um, and so when I think about the defund the police movement, I think it isn't just about, you know, how do we um, address racial disparities in policing? It's about how do we reimagine a country in which people aren't sent to jail or arrested for things that nobody needs to arrest, be arrested for. It's like, most of the crimes that people commit in this country are related to mental health and mental illness challenges or and or related to poverty. Um, and that's the truth of it. And both of those things don't need to be solved by arrest and prison. And we actually know that our prison system isn't set up to be restorative. It's set up to be um, punitive. And so we see people who are released from prison who then recidivate in within five years, you know, three quarters of people end up being rearrested for whatever sorts of reasons. And that kind of just demonstrates that we're not actually help, like prison isn't a helpful tool for anyone. It's only a helpful um, peace of mind for people who believe that someone who is convicted of a crime should be punished. Um, which, which I think is like one of the fundamental kind of American mentality pieces that is rooted in slavery that we need to work through as a country in order to be able to reimagine a public safety system. Um, but what I think about the defund the police movement is that it's, it's a really important um, policy issue for us to wrestle with. We need, like, I think the data that has been shared about police funding relative to other fundings and city budgets, as an example, is, is shocking. Like it, I feel like anybody who has a child, anybody who's gone to school, who plans to have a child should be concerned that police officers and police systems and police cars and police military grade equipment are getting more funding than teachers and social workers and children in the youth programs and housing and healthcare. Like that's, it just feels like, if we say our priorities are, you know, building healthy, thriving communities that are environmentally safe and all sorts of other things, then we should have budgets that reflect that. And I think that's the, one of the primary underpinnings of the defund the police movement. 
And the second one is that it's not, we, there's a kind of, I feel like an immediate knee jerk reaction of like, well, we need the police, like, it, but that's not actually true. Like we, we don't need them. We can try and think about something different. And there's of course many questions about what that could be. Um, some fundamental, some like basic steps could be to start deploying different kinds of first responders for certain kinds of 911 calls. Like there are places in Dallas and I think out in the West Coast that have started to do this on a small scale of um, having trained social workers or trained health professionals of another sort respond to um, mental health crises, um, having conflict resolution people respond to certain kinds of domestic violence calls. There's just a lot of times where we especially don't need an armed officer to show up to a situation. Um, so that was a lot of rattling, but those are some thoughts. <laughs> and then just on the um, marijuana piece too, I think that's such a poignant example of um, intense hypocrisy where we have, well, I mean, on many levels, like when we, when I think about high school, I know like a million of white people who smoke weed all the time. Um, and there are black kids, you know, 16, 17 year old boys, largely, and girls who've been arrested for that, who have citations for that. And to your point, there are also then people who are still serving prison sentences for marijuana, which has now become a very lucrative business, largely for white men. Um, the other injustice there is that even for people who are released for marijuana crimes, many of them um, continue to have criminal records, right? Their records don't become expunged for something that is now lo no longer a crime. And that criminal record then follows them when they try to apply for a job, try to secure housing, try to open a bank account, like try to get an occupational license to become a plumber or a teacher, or whatever it is. And they're just, it's, it's just an entire, it's a really powerful example of how a system, you know, traps someone in and prevents kind of mobility, but it's not just on an individual level, it's at a massive scale for thousands and millions of Americans. Yeah, I think those are the ones too. The one thing, one thing that comes to mind on that, on that conversation is the way we view, depending on your socioeconomic status, the way we view uh, for instance, drug addiction, either as a mental health problem, or if you have enough money, it's viewed as a mental health problem. But if you don't have any money, then it's viewed as a criminal problem. And the idea that we would be able to somehow fix or confront that mental health problem by incarcerating people is like, it just seems insane. I mean, the, like no one, no one who has a mental health problem that will lead them to do drugs will be better off having served a prison sentence that will stop them when they get out from being able to do a job or apply right. to a school or open a bank account. And the, the other thing that I think is um, kind of on the same topic is the idea that prisons are privatized. And this is something that I kind of knew about and seemed like an insane mistake to whoever decided to do that early on. But I, I then found out recently that um, well, I, knew, I knew that once you become a convicted felon, you're no longer allowed the right to vote anymore. But what I didn't know is that places with very high prison populations still receive government funding on the backs of their prison populations because it's considered part of the population of the state. But then those people aren't even allowed to vote. Mm -hmm. And and that, like coupled with the idea that someone who owns a private prison is able to like incentivize the government to pass legislation to further to further their agenda. I mean, I saw the other day that there was a there was a judge who was sentenced to like 28 years in prison because he received something like a million dollars from a juvenile detention center, um, which is like, it's, it's insane. It's insane on a ton of different levels. But whenever I see things like this, I think you can't you can't necessarily change human nature. But at the very least, you can change the policy that would allow a judge who, unfortunately, is an evil person but what, like, what systems do we have in place that allow someone like that to even receive bribes? Like, how, how is it even a system that exists to allow a prison to give a bribe to a judge? Like, how I, I think the, the notion that prisons are privatized furthers the problem of 
having these low level offenses turn people into turn people into essentially like repeat customers for private prisons and rather than looking at it from the rehabilitation standpoint we look at it unbeknownst to most of the population we look at it from like a business perspective and how to like maximize profit uh, profits and yeah i think the private the private prisons coupled with like the the way we handle drug charges in the united states is seems to me to at least be like a cornerstone to the problem mm-hmm. yeah and i think the like under um the like foundations to those cornerstones all tie back to capitalism and racism together um i think the prison industry as a whole there's actually a pretty small percent that are private prisons compared to public prisons, but there is massive profiteering in the prison industry in general. People have to pay for their phone calls. People have to have money in their commissary to get food and new clothes or to get snacks. Like people have to, in some places you're paying, like when you leave jail, for an example, there's a bill for your stay (laughs) that an individual is then responsible for in terms of fines and fees. And so it's just like this massive system of many companies that, and public systems that benefit off of um, incarceration. And to your point, like a lot of those contracts aren't based on incentives tied to uh, reduced recidivism or tied to job placement or, mental health supports or sobriety, they're tied to how many beds are filled, like how many phone calls are being made, how many uniforms do you need, which is a very perverse, which to me is just like a clear indicator of how we're not trying, like prison isn't about helping people return to society or creating a space where someone can work through past trauma that may have led them to commit a crime. Um, It's about, punishment and it's about money. Um, And I think in America, those two things are just incredibly tied to racism, given the foundation of our country first in indigenous genocide and then in black slavery. Like those are the actual ways that America in its current form came to be. And so when we talk about um, kind of capitalism, our, for our early stages of capitalism were slavery. And I just think there's actually, I think some people can think of that as exaggerated or um, an intense way to look at it, but there's actually really clear documentation and linkage points along the way. And so I think there are really concrete steps in that of like, let's end private prison contracts. And because of the pervasiveness of the system of capitalism, it also takes a whole It takes a need to look at something from that system-wide view too and think about how do we actually get to um, the groundwater, if you will, of like what are the actual, what are the actual root problems that we can try to uproot or undo? Yeah, I think those are are great points. Uh, I guess one, one thing that comes to mind is a lot of times attached to this conversation of, of race and inequality, I, I often hear capitalism as something that gets kind of thrown into the mix as part of the problem. And I personally, like I totally understand the, the issues with certain things in the United States being run in a capitalist structure. For instance, like prison seems like an insane thing for anyone to be profiting off of or roads, for instance, like it doesn't make sense to have a farmer who has 10 miles, two people have 10 miles of road to pay for roads when mm-hmm. in a city, they would have to pay for like one square foot. So I guess there are, for me, I understand that there are certain things that are just much better suited for to have nobody profit off of them. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I wonder maybe your thoughts on ways from your perspective that uh, capitalism poses a problem to the inequality that exists in in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that there are really clear examples of how our access to wealth and the type of wealth and income we have then dictate what opportunities and outcomes we can achieve. I think we can talk about that most clearly perhaps in the education realm where our public school funding is often tied to property taxes. Property taxes are based on your ability to buy a home. Your ability to buy a home depends on the kind of wealth and assets that you have and wealth and assets accumulation started for 
white people who've been in America for a long time, in some cases as early as 1700 or 1800 or the Homestead Act, whereas for black people who've been in America, even for a family like mine who's been here for a very long time, um, come early 1800s, like my ancestors were still enslaved. So while the you know white version of myself has has bought a home and can then begin to pass that home on and begin to build wealth. Um, my ancestor is still enslaved and then kind of persecuted for another hundred years. And then there's the Civil Rights Act and then people cannot receive fair housing loans for many other years. Then we passed the Fair Housing Act and there still continues to be issues there. Um, but that ability to then own a home and where you own it allows for you to build wealth, allows for you to go to certain kinds of schools. I think another example is tied to healthcare. Um, there's really powerful examples of both of how both race and class influence how you're treated at a hospital. And you know, many people, I'm sure medical professionals like to think that they're not treating people differently, which I'm sure is true for some. And for others, there's like really intense implicit biases that play out that then influence your access to care, your the type of preventative care you get, um, all of those things and influence obviously your well-being um, and ability to kind of thrive in this country. And so I think the connection of the the way that capitalism impacts us is just everywhere. Like it it's so tied to everything. And because of the uh, vastly different opportunities in access to wealth and income and asset building, it will never totally be a, it can never be a fair playing field um, in this country in particular until we either think seriously about reparations or think seriously about a new kind of system that isn't wealth-based. Yeah, I, I think that makes a ton of sense in that. I think I guess a couple of things. For one, there are certain movements that when there's no discussion around them uh, or no room for discussion because maybe the media can be so polarizing and there doesn't seem like there's any middle ground between people. They see a, a movement like defund the police as crazy because they think it means abolish the police and that you won't be able to call anyone if something crazy happens. Or, and, and even like I'm guilty of this too, but um, when I see something like people talking about capitalism being bad, I think a lot of people's first response is thinking of like the USSR and that the government's going to make all of our cars and like there's not going to be enough like rations to go around. But I think really like when the discussion is had, it seems really logical and obvious that for instance, people shouldn't be profiting off of prisons and that we shouldn't have the quality of education be linked to the monetary status of an entire community because that'll just lead to perpetual problems. Um, one thing I know we wanted to touch on a little bit was uh, intersection and that's something that I had kind of heard, just heard about maybe in the news, but didn't quite know about. And then a few weeks ago, um, I saw an article, I think it was in Vox, but it was about Kimberly Crenshaw and that mm -hmm. at the beginning, uh, intersectionality was a term that, um, it was essentially like a legal term that allowed for people to pose legal defenses on the fact that they could be, be discriminated against and I could be get, potentially getting this wrong so if I am feel, feel free to jump in but the idea that uh, people before this couldn't try legal defenses say if they were a black woman they had to choose one they had to either set the legal precedent or set the legal defense to defend themselves for being discriminated against as a woman or as a black person and so the idea was that um, intersectionality allowed people for the first time to say that their experiences as say a black woman is unique mm -hmm in that it's separate from being a black person or being a woman. Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. And then another thing that comes to mind is like, I guess it's, it's like kind of like a chicken or the egg question is that was the inability of the courts to see the unique experiences of, again, say a black woman, was it something that drove um, culture at the time? Or do you think it was more of a reflection of what was already existing in society? Mm. Yeah. Um, thank you for this question. I think I, I just wanted to like make space for this because I think there is a tendency in American discourse and political discourse in general to kind of do away with nuance in service of keeping things easy and simple to understand. And I think that we're starting to see some of that in 
racial justice conversations were like it's about black people <laughs> and while that's important and true it's also really important to recognize the diversity of experiences in in the black experience and i think as a black woman um especially black trans women there are just so many multiple levels of discrimination and oppression that kind of are intersecting and amplified in ways that are important for us to also talk about in this conversation. It's important to say that, you know, Black women are experiencing higher levels of domestic violence and mental illness and sexual violence and also experience police brutality and also experience the school to prison pipeline and um, also experience discrimination in the workforce, also experience um, poorer treatment from healthcare professionals and kind of to hold all of that together while also talking about the um, broader context of um, kind of racial oppression, if that makes sense. And I think another reason I wanted to bring it up is thinking too about a concept that I found really powerful called the curb cut effect, which is basically the example people use is um, with curbs, like they used to not have that little dip to go across the street. And the dip was created after the American with Disabilities Act for people who are in wheelchairs or need other supports to kind of cross the street. But people pushing strollers, people with suitcases, um, people with all sorts of other needs, people on bikes, like still benefit from that curb. And the idea is in translating that to how we think about policy, how we think about change is what if we think about the most marginalized or most in need person in our community and design a solution for them. And what you find is that in doing that, you actually create something that works for them and it works for everybody else too. Um, and so when I think about something that I'm trying to get better at when I talk about the black experience and think about um, the work that I do is who am I designing for? And is it a, you know, black cis straight man and recognizing that he is still facing significant challenges in his life or is it a black trans disabled woman? And like, you know, I think there are ways to feel like that's so, um, you know, performative or whatever, but I actually think if you try to put your shoes in that person's, sh or put your feet in that person's shoes and, and get to know and understand leaders who reflect those identities will actually be able to design systems and solutions that are better for everyone and um, rooted in kind of that targeted universalism. Yeah, and I, I think that that all makes a ton of sense. I mean, from the perspective of policy um, that's inclusive of a black trans woman will also be inclusive of essentially everyone else at that point, because there's no, if you pick the person who's most easily discriminated against by society. I, that, that, that makes total sense for me. We're, uh, we're coming up at around 35 minutes here. Uh, if, if there was anything else you wanted to talk about, I'm happy to keep going, but otherwise we can. This, is, here. this has been great. I, um, I have many thoughts in my head now though, just from our conversation, but I super appreciate you reaching out and thinking to include me. This was fun. For sure, yeah. It was great to have you on. We'd love to have you on a future episode. And